The year is 1944. Aster Lansky and his family are a Jewish family living in Nazi-occupied Poland. Unfortunately, Aster's family is taken to the concentration camps. He decides to save them, so he goes to meet Heinrich Himmler himself with nothing but a violin in his hands. He plays Himmler a sad piece of music, making his heart burn in compassion and convinces him to release his family. It's an amazing story, isn't it? Well, it's not exactly true. But imagine the sort of faith that you as a society would have to have in music for such a story to be an important part of your literature. Because this is exactly the ancient Greek story of Orpheus. Hello everyone and welcome to Music History and Overview from Below, where we follow the story of Western music from ancient Greece to the day I die. Now, of course, the term ancient Greece is a broad term that can cover hundreds of years. But no matter what period in Greek history you're looking at, the best place to start is with their stories about their gods and legends. One of these legends is Orpheus, the great musician who lost his wife on the day of their marriage. He then traveled to the land of the dead, played his music for Hades, softened his heart, and got his wife back. This is the ancient Greek view about music. Music wasn't just another fun activity that a Greek man would do, like for example engaging in debates or having sex with 14 year old boys. Music was seen as something which had immense power and influence over not just humans, but also the gods. It could even be used as a medicine, and its fundamental laws were part of the laws of the cosmos. When Zeus created the world, he asked the other gods whether they thought anything else could be added to it. They replied, why don't you create immortal beings who could put everything in order using music? And this is when Zeus created the Muses, the group of goddesses which were associated with music, dance, and poetry. These goddesses gave the gift of music to humans. For humans, music wasn't just a fun activity. It was also a way to cope with the pain of mortality and for some to even achieve immortality in poetry and song. In Homeric Greece, the traveling storytellers who sometimes accompanied their stories with music praised the muses for giving them the ability to sing and play music. Thamaris, a storyteller that claimed he could beat the muses in music, was punished by them and lost his musical abilities. The muses weren't the only gods associated with music. Apollo is often seen playing the lyre and he was sometimes referred to as the leader of the muses. He was also associated with the pian, a form of choral music which we will get to later in this video. Another musical god was Dionysus, the god associated with wine and the dithyria. Dionysus is often seen accompanied by other mythical creatures who are dancing or playing music. It is in this society that the story of Orpheus was formed, and it wasn't the only story about musicians with extraordinary powers. Arion, who was sent to die in the sea, attracted dolphins who then saved him by playing music. And Amphion built the city's walls by moving stones with the sound of his lyre. As we're gonna see in our historical overview, the concept of composer is a recent invention. Especially when it's tied to concepts like originality, supernatural inspiration, and creation from nothing, it takes a romantic flavor which makes it a concept with limited historical application. The ancient Greeks did think of music as something which was caused by supernatural inspiration. It was the gods and the muses that gave humans these abilities and inspired musical ideas. But they didn't understand music as the artistic creation of a person called the composer whose main job was to create masterworks that could stand on their own. Now there are many reasons for this. First, a systematic approach to notation wasn't still developed. Also, instrumental music for its own sake didn't really exist outside of musical competitions and music was largely seen as subordinate to the words. This is why in ancient Greek history we have to deal with the concept of the poet-composer as opposed to the poet or the composer. Now slowly during the 8th century BC the genre of lyric poetry started to emerge. Lyric poetry wasn't completely sung as today's songs are and the performance was probably a mixture of singing and recitation. They were however accompanied by music and this musical poetry could be written for any occasion, from a funeral to a wedding. Lyric poetry first flourished in Ionia, or the region which is today's western Turkey. The island of Lesbos was an important place that gave birth to great lyric poets like Sappho and Alcaeus. Sappho was one of the few female poet musicians in ancient Greece, 
and she became famous during her own lifetime. Lesbos was in close contact with Lydia and Phrygia and absorbed their musical influences. In fact, the Aulos, the Phrygian mode, and the Dionysian cult migrated to mainland Greece from Ionia. Later, in the 7th century BC, the genre of lyric poetry too started migrating westwards to mainland Greece. It especially flourished in Sparta, which might sound surprising to some people. As the exaggerating animal, we humans create a lot of legends which are of course not accurate. Even though Sparta was famous for bravery in fighting, it wasn't a huge barracks that only bred large muscular soldiers. Sparta had a dynamic cultural life and Spartans loved music and poetry. Terpander, one of the central figures in Spartan lyric poetry, was a native of Lesbos. Another important poet was Alcman, who was also probably Ionian, but adopted the Dorian style when he settled in Sparta. Lyric poetry dealt with a range of different topics. Most of the time it was from the poet's point of view and it generally had a didactic tone. But it could also be composed as a praise of a god or a person, or even take the form of a prayer, as we can see in one of Sappho's poems, in which she asks the god to take care of her brother. Lyric poetry continued through the 5th century BC or the classical period. But it wasn't the only genre and the musical life of the ancient Greeks also included a lot of other activities. Classical Greek society was a musical society and learning to sing and play an instrument was an important aspect of aristocratic education. Now of course everyone wasn't trained in music. But if a Greek man wanted to show that he was a man of nobility and culture, he had to be able to sing and play the lyre. Musical life in classical Greece had different levels, from the private level of the symposiums to the public level of the religious festivals, musical competitions, and dramas. On the private level, there were many occasions where the Greeks played music. Obviously, weddings were one of the most important ones. When the groom took the bride from her father's house to the new house, people who accompanied them sang songs, played music and danced. Funerals too were an important occasion. Noble families that wanted to glorify their dead sang laments or often brought in professional musicians. But perhaps the most important event on the private level was the symposium. The symposium was a drinking party where men dined together, drank wine and recited poetry in praise of the gods or even on a social or political issue. In Plato's symposium, for example, we see people taking turns praising the gods, or even talking about the origins of homosexuality. Another interesting thing in Plato's symposium is the presence of a young female musician. Now that's a prostitute. But part of a prostitute's job was to entertain their clients by playing music on the aulos. In fact, the term oletris meant both prostitute and a female aulos player. This is really interesting because the term aulos wasn't just a name for that instrument and referred to any sort of long tube. So the term oletris probably means a female person who blows on a variety of tubes. This wasn't the only musical activity of the symposium. The men sang in praise of Zeus as a group and later at night those who had the skill played the lyre and recited poetry. Greek society, just like any other society at the time, was highly patriarchal. During the symposium, women of the house remained in the back room, but they also engaged in musical activities. In Plato's symposium, for example, when the men decide to have a serious conversation, they actually send the prostitute to the women's room to play music. On the public level, musical competitions played an important role in Greek society, so much as the gods too engaged in them. Marcias was a satyr, a mythical creature, that found Athena's old aulos, so he started playing on it. He made such a beautiful sound that he claimed he could beat Apollo in a musical contest. Apollo accepted to compete with the muses as their judges. Both of them played beautifully, so in true godlike fashion, Apollo decided to cheat. He turned his lyre upside down and played the same thing, but because Marcias was playing a wind instrument, he couldn't do this, so Apollo played him alive. Now fortunately down on the earth the competitions weren't as intense but they were also extremely important. First of all the existence of such competitions meant that music was becoming a more complicated professional affair. It also meant that musicians from different parts of the Greek world would meet and influence each other. But these were not the most important result. To have a standard for judgment the musical competitions posed a set of rules for the musical pieces. But to get the attention of the judges, musicians had to achieve something individual and new within those rules. To let the artists breathe, you have to choke them just enough because creativity is not absolute freedom. Creativity is a negotiation between freedom and oppression. Musical competitions had different parts which dealt with different musical techniques. There were five prominent competitions. 
singing to the kithara, singing to the aulos, playing the kithara, playing the aulos, and reciting poetry. Winners not only won material prizes, but they also gained fame and glory. Let's turn to the religious festivals now. There were two types of religious music that were especially important, the peon and the dithyram. The peon and the dithyram were often associated, respectively, with Apollo and Dionysus. This meant that the music of the peon was mostly in the calm Dorian mode, while the music of the dithyram was in the more energetic Phrygian. Peons and dithyrams were collective musical activities in which choruses played an important role. Choruses were mostly organized by gender and age. We often have choruses of young girls or young boys who sing and dance. In Athens, people were even divided to 10 groups which then had to provide two choruses of men and young boys, and then these choruses competed with each other. In Dithyrams, there were choruses of 50 men who were accompanied by an aulos player that stood in the middle. Choruses of girls mostly took part in another musical activity called the Panathenia, which was a glorification of the goddess Athena. But choruses weren't confined to religious festivals. Another important activity that involved music was drama. Ancient Greek drama was really different from modern theater or even from early operas which were directly based on it. In early Greek drama, most of the time there was only one actor present on the stage and most of the narrative was driven forward by choral song. The chorus often started the narrative while accompanied by an aulos. Through the story, they exchanged comments with the actor and they ended the drama by leaving the stage while singing. In later dramas where other actors were introduced, the chorus functioned as a commentator on the events or the emotions of the characters, very much like arias in Italian opera. In tragedies, the chorus was on high moral ground, but in comedies it was less serious and they sometimes even wore animal costumes. The chorus wasn't the only musical element in a drama. There were also episodes in which the solo aulos would play extended instrumental passages. The music written for dramas was also really complicated and it used a variety of modes from Dorian to Mixolydian and Phrygian. Different modes were used to intensify different emotions, a practice which was again taken up by Monteverdi and other Italian opera composers. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos on the history of Western music.